We're speaking right now to John Van Wyk, the legendary John Van Wyk. John, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, give me a how and when you got started. I know you were general telephone for like like centuries. Yeah, you know, I've got a, a, a different entry into uh, the, the broadcast uh, business a little later in my life. Uh, although it started before I was born, actually, believe it or not. Um, my uncle Raul, Rollin Van Wyk, who uh, was the program manager of WKBZ and the, may have been the very first program manager of WKBZ back in the early 1930s. Wow. He was a pharmacist, but he had interned at WOOD Radio in Grand Rapids where he grew up before he went to pharmacy school. My grandfather was a pharmacist. He talked my grandfather into buying a pharmacy here in the Muskegon area. Okay. And the station WKBZ was just opening up. And so he went there to say, oh, you know, I've got some experience. I love radio. And so my uncle became a program director at WKBZ back in the 1930s. And because of that, my sec another uncle, my uncle Paul Van Wyk, my uncle Paul Van Wyk was an electrical engineer and, and they hired him to be a broadcast engineer at WKBZ as well. So I grew up with two of my favorite uncles, I have three favorite uncles, but two of my favorite uncles in the broadcast business at WKBZ here in Muskegon. And uh, they literally, I mean, my, my whole life, my, and my uncle uh, Paul only had one, one son, and uh, my, my cousin Dave, uh, who didn't go into the broadcast industry, but my uncle Raul and my Aunt Carol never had any children. And so I was kind of their, their son growing up, and I mean literally growing up around radio. My Uncle Paul worked at Bursmo Electric as well as WKBZ, and uh, worked until uh, he retired after some 60 years, literally at WKBZ as, as an engineer. And, um, and my uncle, my uncle Raul, went back and forth a little bit, uh, maybe became a pharmacist in, in the arcade pharmacy uh, in downtown Muskegon that was open until 1971 when the, uh, when the mall was built in downtown Muskegon and that, that store closed. So I had a, 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 that history. The second part of that history and entry point was that that family had a band called the Harmony Orchestra. And the Harmony Orchestra was a studio orchestra at the WKBZ Apple Avenue studio. Wow. Which the building is just off the corner of Wood and Apple on Apple Avenue. Yeah. And that was their live studio during the 1930s. That Harmony band had my Aunt Ruth in the band. My Aunt Ruth uh, married an Uncle Frank who was in the railroad business. They moved to Birmingham, Michigan, and the band was in need of a female singer. And so they advertised in the Muskegon Chronicle, want ads, we're looking for a female singer for this house band called the Harmony Orchestra at uh, WKBZ. And sure enough, here comes my mother along, who was a Welsh immigrant and had got a great soprano voice, and got hired by the Harmony Orchestra. Oh, Fell in love with my dad, and uh, then ten years later I was born. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so you were pretty much destined, but even in your role working for General Telephone Company, you dealt with lots of media people. Well, and, and I did, uh, because I, I did public relations for the last 23 years. I was mm -hmm. in charge of public relations for the state of Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania when I, when I retired. Um, but one of, one of and, and the entry point, my entry point into the broadcast industry was dealing with the media. Right. I mean, I wore a lot of different hats. I dealt with the print media and the electronic media uh, quite a bit and was, was it literally, uh, but I call it the good, bad, and the ugly of the phone company. <laughs> and, and, you know, you, you were on there good when we were giving money away and doing great things in the community. Uh, the, the, the bad was, uh, hey, we've got a rate increase coming up. And the ugly was storm damage and, and, uh, and, and you know, in those kind of things when employees got hurt. Yeah. You know, so it was a good, bad, and the ugly, and you were always available for the media at that point in time. Right. I mean, I'd give media calls all times of the day, no matter if it's especially during storm damage and those kinds of things. So I dealt with the media a lot. Yeah, so and you it were was, really heavily yeah, immersed and was, in the was, media I, I, world. I was a member of the Michigan Association of Broadcasters because of that, okay. and because we sponsored Broadcast Excellence Awards and, and everything like that. Then back in the late 80s, early 90s, a guy by the name of Oscar Osmo, <laughs> behind the camera, uh, joined the JCs in Muskegon. Okay. And then uh, Oscar was doing a morning program on WKBZ out on Pontaluna Road, a studio out there. And we signed, somehow talked Oscar into letting a couple of us come on every Friday morning and talk about the JCs. 
and we did. And Oscar was moving the, the program uh, went to different restaurants around the Muskegon area yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. And so we joined uh, Oscar for breakfast on Friday morning and talk about what the JCs were doing in the community. And Oscar was getting ready to move to a different radio station, and uh, just happened to call me up one day and said. You know, we, this worked out real well on Fridays with you and Greg Roberts and coming into the studio. And how would you guys like to join me and do a Saturday morning radio program on, on uh, WEFG 97.5? And uh, that, that we met with uh, the, the station owner, Bob Bolton, and, and uh, Jim Schlichting, who was a program director and sales manager, or whatever else hats that Schlichting wore <laughs> at, at that time, sat down and he said, and they actually read an ad in the Chronicle that we were starting this Saturday morning program and March 2nd, 1992 is uh, when we went on the air and uh, did that for, I don't know, eight or ten years anyway. And uh, we did that Saturday morning program, which a lot of things we did on there we can't really repeat. <laughs> the on-air stuff was somewhat legitimate. <laughs> But we we had a good time. We we uh, we had we cast crew members at that point in time. Uh, Bill Iddings was the uh, arts and entertainment um, editor of the Muskegon Chronicle, and so we had Bill come on to talk about the symphony, and talk about different things that were happening in the cultural aspect of Muskegon. And Bill became a regular member of the team. Annette, um, that's the last name. Uh, we call her Bach, but it's, it's a, that's her stage name. I yeah, and that Bach was her stage name, and and that was a, a member. She was involved with a, 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 a community theater and all those kind of things. So she added a great female voice, and uh, I think she, her name was Kitty Litter. I yeah. think on the, on the, <laughs> on the <laughs> radio stupid, broadcast. Stupid news. So there was, and, and Bill Iddings was into writing radio theater plays. Okay. And has been actually published many times, and and he writes uh, screenplays and uh, and and uh, and plays. And Bill wrote some uh, radio theater dramas that we did, we produced on that radio station, which would never um, t t pass the test of time today uh, <laughs> at all. Uh, and but we had some great personalities that were on there: Greg Roberts, uh, the G Man. We we would pull some uh, some interesting. Uh, We'd send G-Man out on scavenger hunts on Saturday mornings <laughs> and see what he could come back yeah, with. Free stuff. Yeah, free stuff. We'd come back with a case of uh, oil. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was, that was, that was a, we, we had a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, it was it was somewhat the WKRP in Cincinnati style, um, <laughs> but it was well we had to because it was called talking tunes. We had to play what four tunes per hour, something. <laughs> <laughs> that was what Bob Bolton wanted us to do. Call it talking tunes. You got to play some tunes. So we played some tunes, but they weren't necessarily always top forty. <laughs> so, so we had we had a lot of lot of fun uh, doing that. Um, we. An interesting story about you know when people get fired from uh, radio jobs and those kind of things. Obviously, Howard Stern's got many stories, and and everybody's got a story about getting fired. Uh, we, we were doing a Saturday morning a Saturday morning program from the uh, the Holiday Inn. You know, we we did that for a number of months uh, from the Holiday Inn, and I'd go uh, I'd have the equipment with me, and and Greg Roberts would show up. We put the banner up and call back to the studio. Mike Hansen was the uh, the the engineer at that point in time. And this one Saturday morning morning, set up all the stuff and called and no answer at the studio. The, the line we called in on, we're going, you know, something wrong. And uh, we, Greg Roberts ran back to the studio and the studio was locked up, nobody was there. And we're going, what's going on? And, and so I finally got a hold of uh, Jim Schlichting and I said, what, what's going on, Jim? Is Mike all right? I mean, everything going on? He said, well, you guys got canceled. And <laughs> did, did somebody tell you that you guys got canceled? And we went, no. I still have that banner, by the way. <laughs> I never heard that story. <laughs> We were done. I was just so, so somebody had bought, purchased the radio station, okay. and they were going to turn that station into a religious format. Oh, yeah. And they said, "You get those, that, those guys on Saturday mornings just don't fit. They're done." Uh, and they forgot to pass the word on to uh, us that we're doing the show. You were off the air. And didn't so we were off the air. Fortunately <laughs> enough, at that point in time, uh, Brian Worsham had had joined the, the the regular crew, and Brian Worsham had a good relationship going with Mark Dixon at WMUS, and so and they so. Immediately, MUS and everybody knew that we were out of a job, right. and so we got a call from Mark Dixon saying, "Hey, we've got this little closet uh, out at uh, our studio. Oh, it's over here in the, oh, yeah. in the corner. We've got this little closet out here that we have. We're operating in uh, WMUS AM out of." 
you know, 1090 WMUS AM. And uh, how would you guys like to do a Friday afternoon program? And we're going, uh, yeah, that'd be kind of fun. So we started out doing two hours, ended up doing three hours on Friday afternoons, and uh, did that for probably 10 years. Uh, during that period of time, WMUS, uh, was, it was a clear channel, owned the, the stations at that point in time. The call letters, WKBZ, became available mm -hmm. after Grand Valley, who had purchased uh, that, that, um, that, that frequency, 850 AM, mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 they abandoned the call letters. They were still broadcasting and using 850 as a WGVU AM simulcasting their FM station. Mm -hmm. And so Clear Channel bought the, uh, the call letters. Okay. or got the callers, I don't know how you do that with the FCC, and so they decided to change the call letter station from WMUS AM to WKBZ. And WKBZ having a huge legacy yep. in the Muskegon area, it was kind of a natural and calling it news talk because uh, for the very long period of time WKBZ was the news station in, of record in Muskegon because they did have the news reporters and everything else. So it just kind of made a natural thing. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed it because my family legacy is yes. WKBZ. Yeah. And so I've had, I've had a ball. Full doing circle. It. Full circle doing it. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I mean, obviously my Uncle Ra and Uncle Paul were very influential yeah. in me wanting to be in the industry my whole life. Yeah. And then and the, the comfort of being in the studio and dealing with the electronic media, uh, I was just kind of my persona and, and doing that. So when it, when it came, when I retired uh, 10 years ago from the, the telephone company, Mark Dixon said, why don't you do a morning program on uh, WKBZ and call it Talk in Muskegon because the, we are the talk of Muskegon. Yeah. And I said that that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> and you sound like you've had fun with it. Oh, we've had a, we've had a, we've had a great time. Brian Worsham uh, is still doing the program with me. Uh, it continues to to be my uh, my oldest son, basically. <laughs> 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 and uh, it, we've had we've had uh, great crew members in and out uh, over the years, and uh, just the just the the atmosphere of, of being in a radio studio. Yeah. I, if you go back to the house that I grew up in. On Seminole Road, you walk in the front door and there's this cupboard there. It's got double doors on it. And if you go up in there, my sister and I still own the home, and we go up in there, we've told the, anybody that's lived there, you're not to change this one wall in there because I had, uh, with a paintbrush, uh, drew on the wall my radio studio when I was a little kid. Oh, I love and, it. And, so, and they had some old equipment in there that kind of looked like, I don't know what, what it was, but I had, it was my radio equipment when I was a little kid. Love that was my radio studio. So, so I grew up with it in my blood. Yeah, and, you uh, really did. So, so, and and I'm, I'm having a ball doing this. And it keeps me, in, in my retirement, keeps me real active with the community. Yeah. Obviously, we want to know everything that's going on in the community and and uh, and the people that I've met. I mean, you guys included in that and my circle of friends and, mm -hmm. and the people and acquaintances in Muskegon, there aren't any better people that are involved in media. Yeah. I can tell you that. That's I mean, they cool. really are. That's cool. Because because they do know what's going on in the community, and yep. they they have all everybody has their own opinions about what should be done in the community. And well, so it's it's a fun it's a fun group of people to be around. And you've talked about giving back to the yep. community. Could you address that? Oh, giving back. You know, I, I guess it was what I was taught when I was growing up, and with uh, with my parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad was in uh, the Kiwanis Club growing up, and and they were all active. And my mother is real active in the church and Beta Sigma Phi sorority, and and they were all gi always giving back to the community. And I, that's the way I was uh, brought up, and especially being brought up in a retail environment mm -hmm. with a drugstore in downtown Muskegon. Uh, my, my dad opened the store at 5.30 in the morning, back in an era where Lakey Foundry, Teledyne Continental Motors, all the big industries were downtown and mm -hmm. people rode the buses. Well, that was a bus terminal building where the pharmacy was located. And my dad telling me that every time he turned the key in the morning, he was fearful that nobody would walk through the door. Oh. And they, when they did walk through the door, they were family members. Because yep. they contributed, he kept telling me, everybody coming in the door is contributing to your college scholarship. Yep. You know, they're contributing to the well-being of our family. They are our family, they our extended family. family. Yep. And so you treat them like family. Yep. And that's and, and and but they gave back to the community as well with their time and their dollars uh, to being a part of the community. So it was it was part of who I was when I grew up. That's and, uh, very and, cool. uh, I don't think I had a choice. Yeah, you, it was bred <laughs> into you from day one. It was. John, address the situation, and we've talked about this, you and I, and I'm sure you have with everybody in media. 
about what would happen when a local radio station would do have some sort of major telephone based <laughs> promotion. What? What? Because you worked in PR for Gentel. Uh, well, I, I did, and uh, one of one of the difficult things we had, especially with, with MUS and trade radio and and a lot of a lot of different contests, cash call and those kinds of things, it would bottle up the network. I mean, the telephone network is very much like a highway system. Okay. If everybody got on the on the highway system at the same time with their cars, nobody would go anywhere. Yeah. And it's built for maximum amount of usage, and it's all measured and everything else. But when radio stations did contests, switching systems would literally lock up, Jeez. and nobody could call because everybody's lifting their phone up at the same time to get dial tone. And, and the switches back in the electromechanical days of uh, telephone, it would just lock right up. <laughs> wow. and so, so we literally had to come. We had meetings with all of the the, the Fred Tascones of the world, uh, WTRU, and with uh, Tim Actorhoffs, sure. and saying, "Will you guys limit this down? Don't say take. We're going to take the seven hundredth caller." <laughs> you know, take, you know, and we had an agreement. We had a, we didn't have a signed agreement. We had an agreement that they would keep it under twelve. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know, know that. Didn't you know that? I oh. didn't realize oh, that was yeah. an actual agreement. Oh, oh yeah, I mean, because we're going, hey, you know, you guys, we, we will restrict you from doing this. <laughs> <laughs> because we could, we could have gone to the public service commission and say, "Hey, these people are are, yeah, are wrecking our network." The phone and in, in case yeah. of an emergency, if You're the right. thing locks up, yep. you know, and, and needed to, so we we would plead our case, and they going, "Yeah, but we, you know, when people call in and do that." You say, "Yeah, but only a certain amount can because the switch locks up." Yeah. Especially the North Muskegon seven four four exchange, yep. when people calling into uh, to WMUS would lock up. Oh, so yeah. we had an, we had an agreement yeah. uh, back then, and saying. We'll keep we'll keep it under twelve. You know, it was a badge of honor for those who worked at a radio station to do to know that they actually messed up the phone company. You know that. I, I hate to say that. Speaking of people you've worked with, some of the favorites you've worked with in your over the years in your different capacities. Oh gosh, you know the the the, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, uh, I mean uh, the the people in the political sphere that, oh, yeah. the, that, that we've had. Uh, Steve Warmington, mayor of the city of oh, Muskegon, yeah. sure. longtime friend. I, I managed his campaign all three times that he ran. Yeah. Did some great things to turn around the city of Muskegon. Yeah. Uh, you know, as we're seeing in the in the decade of the uh, the 2010. Decade, you know, he, uh, there's a lot of things that that, um, but again, a lot of people that I, I worked with that were regulars on radio programs that I had as well. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the people that ran festivals and events, and I I don't want to start naming them off because there's way too many of them uh, over the years of people that I worked with with so the old summer celebration and airfare and oh, and yeah. uh, shoreline spectacular and and bike time and and they're just a, just a ton of people. And uh, you know, I, there's not very many people I dislike. Yeah. There's a couple people, and they all work for the Chronicle. But <laughs> 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 well, we won't mention their names because they've long passed. But um, <laughs> crazy stories you can tell. Anything that jumps out, a couple of them uh, that you go, boy. We can actually tell on the air. I think probably, <laughs> and I don't know whose idea it was, you know, because it went back in, in, in a radio studio where you've got the likes of an Oscar Osbo and Greg Roberts and <laughs> Bill Eddings and <laughs> Brian Worsham. You come up with kind of stupid ideas, and and, and, and one, of, one of them that we did for a number of years was Spam Fest. Spam Fest? Spam Fest. And, and I contacted uh, a gal by the name of Mary Harris at Hormel Foods, and she was in charge of publicity promotions for Spam. And we said, we want to do the Spam Fest. So we had a Spam oh, Chili Cook-Off, oh, we had a great. Spam Fest on, on, in, uh, in Lakeside. During Lakes or like Memorial Day, I believe it was, yeah. and we had we we had sculpt spam sculpturing contest, and and Hormel Foods would send us a package every year of giveaway items, right. everything from flip flops to boxer underwear, <laughs> <laughs> and we we would have Elvis impersonators. Yeah. That that was probably one of the dumber things that we did. And, and <laughs> <laughs> but people literally, even you know, even up in uh, that that happened 25 years ago, and literally people will come up to me today and say, "When are you guys going to do Spam Fest?" <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, that's probably that, that's that sticks fun. out, and it's that's something really people fun. remembered about. off the wall, something oh, yeah, unusual. You didn't see that in every market. Final question: sure. Looking, we're talking about the history of radio in Muskegon. Anything? 
in terms of where you see it all going, where it's been, any observations that you would make? And you kind of, you were in such a unique position. You you saw it from a lot of different sides. And I did, and I did, and I think that's I guess maybe preserving the, the legacy, and not necessarily to see my the name Van Wake up in the lights. Yeah. But but to knowing that my uncle Paul and my uncle Raul and my mom and dad yeah. they all were in the radio business, and it's something that was a huge fabric in my life, yeah. and that I grew up with, and yeah. the musical history and and everything else. And to me, preserving the radio history of Muskegon, knowing what went on with that studio on Apple Avenue, mm -hmm. the kind of personalities that would have gone through there over the years, yeah. you know, and to preserve that as part of the Muskegon fabric of our community. Sure. Without, without radio, what would this community have looked like? Right. Without the, the news source, the media, and the music, and, and all those kinds of things, and the personalities that were driving that, mm -hmm. both from the broadcast side, and the sales side, and the engineering side. You know, you, you've got a tremendous amount of people that earn their living doing it, Mm -hmm. And we're a fabric of the community. So I, I think it's one of these kind of things that I'm excited, obviously excited about working on this kind of a project. Mm -hmm. But but being able to pull all of that together and being able for somebody, um, at, you know, the year 2090 to, to go into the Lakeshore Museum Center and say, whoa, yeah. what is a vacuum tube? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you know? And, and to, to be able to say, they were present when the Occidental Hotel was demolished. Oh, yeah. They were present when the Seaway opened up, the St. Lawrence Seaway opened up, yeah. and ships started coming into Muskegon, foreign ships coming into the Great Lakes. These events were covered by radio. You bet. You know, I, what, one of the, the pictures that you, hopefully you'll see in the, in the museum is of the centennial celebration in 1936 wow. at, uh, the, at the Mart Dock. And they created this this village, lumbering village, down there for uh, like ten days. Yeah. Big festival celebrating the hundredth anniversary of the county, and right in the middle of it is a WKBZ booth, and they were there broadcasting live from the Centennial wow. 1936. That is this so This is a cool. part of of the fabric of the, of, uh, the Muskegon community, and it continues to be. Yep. And it continues to be mm -hmm. with the active stations, and and hopefully in the future when you're watching this. They'll still be radio. <laughs> yep. yep, I believe. So I mean, that's I mean, that's the importance of, of the of the project. Beautiful, beautiful, John. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. This is great. Okay. Any questions?